All right, welcome back, everyone. Our first speaker for our third segment is Dr. Bill Mitch. Bill has been, an, has been eminent scholar and director, Everglades Wetland Research Park, and Juliet C. Sproul Chair for Southwest Florida Habitat Restoration at Florida Gulf Coast University in Naples since 2012, Naples, Florida, since 2012. Before that, he was Distinguished Professor of Environmental Science at The Ohio State University. I, I'm, I get this Big Ten stuff, this is important. For 26 years and is founding director of the 50-acre Olentangy River Rutland Research Park. He holds courtesy faculty appointments at University of South Florida, University of Florida, University of Notre Dame, and The Ohio State University. His research and teaching have focused on wetland ecology and biogeochemistry, wetland creation and, rest and restoration, and ecological engineering of wetlands, rivers, and landscapes. His many publications include five editions of the text reference book, Wetlands, and he founded in 1992 and continues as editor-in-chief of the International Journal Ecological Engineering. He founded the American Ecological Engineering Society in 2000 and is past president of that society and the, Soci the Society of Wetland Scientists. He has given over 350 invited presentations around the world on wetlands, ecological engineering, and restoration, and related topics. In 2004, he was awarded the 2004 Stockholm Water Prize by H.M. King Carl the 16th Gustav of Sweden. I had to quickly read those Roman numerals. He, is also he has also received the um, Outstanding Wetland Scientist Award in 2016 at the 10th Intercol Wetland Conference in Changshu, China, the Ramsar Award for Merit in 2015 at the Ramsar COP meeting in Punta de Este, Uruguay, an Einstein Professorship in 2010 by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, the Lifetime Achievement Award from Society of Wetland Scientists in 2007 in Sacramento, California, and the Theodore M. Sperry Award from the Society, so the Society for Ecological Restoration in 2005 in Zaragoza, Spain. He was also awarded three Fulbright scholarships for research and teaching in Denmark, Botswana, and Poland. Dr. Mitch has advised with thesis or dissertation 78 graduate students at four universities to completion. 19 of his former grad students and postdocs are teaching in universities in the United States and the world. And we are thrilled to welcome him here today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill Mitch. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yay. Well, thank you, and it's an honor to be invited to Penn State and still keep me allow, uh, com coming when a Ohio State University, now it's dimly lit, so <laughs> for a reason, so you can barely read it, Ohio State. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, actually, I'm rooting for Notre Dame. I have a Notre Dame shirt on, and uh, so I was pulling a little bit for Penn State and not for Ohio State. Um, I'm going to talk about merging ecology and design, and I guess my talk's going to jump around to different topics, and so let's just get going. And, uh, but I'm going to be talking about the importance of ecosystem research in designing sustainable landscapes. I'm a researcher, I'm a scientist, I'm a sometimes engineer, and uh, in fact, combining the fields of engineering, I can understand now. That I know you're angst about un combining fields that often don't talk to each other. You talk about two fields that don't talk to each other, the engineers and the ecologists, and here we started a field called ecological engineering, and that, w that was an adventure. So I'm going to share a little bit with you on that first. The ecological engineering idea is almost the same discussion you're having that we had 20 years ago for this field. Almost the same, why don't we all get together, why can't we join these fields? And this is what we were proposing at the time for ecological engineering. It was to be, and maybe still will be, the third leg of ecology. Ecology has theoretical ecology, it has applied ecology, and we felt that this third field that feeds from those two of the design, restoration, and creation of ecosystems is the missing thing in ecology. Now, that sometimes landscape architects do. So sometimes 
biologists try, but they don't do very well. But the important thing I heard earlier today was that I feel like the ecological engineering in this case, the applied field, will test the theories that we have in ecology. And I'll show you some quotes in a minute that are kind of cute, but that feedback is enormously important. And then we put dotted line over here in reference to Bob Costanza and his ecological economics that that's how you keep score. You know, we need a new economics to, to keep score. So that was the, you know, that was published in Environmental Science Technology, you know, what, 25 years ago. Uh, this is a definition. You notice it has all the right words, and although this was published in our book with uh, Sven Jorgensen in 2004, really it was a decade before we came up with this definition. We were using the word sustainable and all that kind of thing before it was in vogue to use it. Now everybody uses it. But the design of sustainable ecosystems that integrate human society with its natural environment for the benefit of both. And I use that as the test when I run, when I have the journal and somebody sends me a paper and if it's just engineering it gets rejected. If it's just descriptive ecology it gets rejected. It, it, the, the, it has to show a benefit for nature and for uh, society. Ecological engineering is not gardening, and I have so many discussions with my colleagues over that, because a lot of what we do in restoration, quite frankly, is gardening and zookeeping. Um, it's unfortunate, and it's based on the idea of self-organizing. We've heard that now discussed many times today already, self-organization. I like to use the term self-design, because that's the applied aspect, and design, I can now, determined is the most important word for two professions, not one, for engineers and for architects, especially landscape architects, right? It's, it's a key word. Um, so it's the self-design self capability of nature. This is a picture of the journal. It started in 1992, so it's 25 years old. In fact, Elsevier, when I, I'm, I'm going to be stepping down now because Elsevier talked to me a couple uh, years ago, and they said, well, Bill, uh, you know, how long have you been editor? And I said, well, I started 25 years ago, and they almost croaked. They said, nobody, nobody runs a journal for 25 years. So that I knew my days were <laughs> numbered, but, uh, but I still am editor-in-chief. We get about 12 volumes a year, 1,500 submissions per year, 58% reduction rate approximately. Uh, get a ton of papers from China. I think they get it a little bit more than do the Western countries. The USA, the USA is a little slow in ecological and catching on ecological engineering. I don't know why. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple quotes that sort of got my got me going in a, a 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Uh, one person is Tony Bradshaw. If you ever study restoration ecology, he was sort of the original saint uh, from the UK on that subject. And he says restoration of a disturbed ecosystem is the acid test of our understanding of the system. He was basically saying, when we start restoring, creating ecosystems, we'll really know whether our, our theories are right or wrong. I, I always loved that quote. Um, and he would say, we'll learn more from our failures than from our successes, since the failure cl clearly reveals inaccuracy of the idea. That's why when I started ecological engineering, I was begging people to send me people, uh, papers on failures. But nobody ever does. They just won't do it. I mean, but how are we going to learn if we don't learn from our failures? Uh, so that was one quote. And then this one from John Cairns. He was also a very distinguished scientist at Virginia Tech for many years. Uh, one of the most compelling reasons for failure of theoretical ecologists to spend uh, more time on restoration ecology is the exposure of serious weaknesses in many of the widely accepted theories and concepts in ecology. He's basically saying, when we start to really restore and create ecosystems, we're going to find out that half the ecological theories we have are nonsense. And we have found that out. We're, and I'll give you some, maybe I'll be able to throw a couple examples of it. So it's that, when that kind of quotes were coming out in the literature and so on, that's when I decided we needed a journal. And then I also decided, well, here I am at The Ohio State University, the greatest university on the planet, according to them. And, uh, <laughs> And I needed to have a, a wetland, a wetland research park. And so this is when it all started with a, a story in the Columbus Dispatch in 1991. Then it ended up on Wall Street Journal. It ended up all over the place. 
and eventually the administration had to surrender to me and, and we found this great site. But what we, the reason was, there's several reasons. One is to, to have a lab where you can test restoration techniques, a continual outdoor lab, a real wetland on the campus uh, for educating our students, for testing ideas, and uh, also, quite frankly, some of the ecological questions we are asking and continue to ask don't have the right space scale and time scale to fit in a test tube. They're not, they don't, they don't, they're not answered in a laboratory. They have to be answered in a real full-scale ecosystem. So this is what we built, the, Olin, the William H. Shermeyer Olin Tangy River Wetland Research Park at The Ohio State University. It's a 50-acre site. Uh, you can see, uh, well, that's the years I was there, to, to about 2012, and we published data through 2013 and really learned a lot over those years. But that's the time scale we need for a lot of the things that we do in the restoration landscape field. You don't get answers in one or two years. And you don't get answers in little tubs called mesocosms all the time, which we will talk about. In fact, you can see our mesocosms. They're tiny little dots right there. Trust me, they're there. Right? One square meter mesocosms. These are 10,000 square meters. And we need both scales to do experiments. By the way, I take a lot of grief because the original wetlands we built there were kidney shaped because we refer to wetlands as kidneys of our landscape and have for years. Uh, it is not true that I built them as kidney shaped for that reason, but nobody believes me. So these still are referred to as Ohio State's kidneys. Uh, this diagram with the kidney wetlands, experimental wetlands, an oxbow that we created that did not require, these were labs where water was pumped through, these were not pumped. Uh, we built a building, we built mesocosm area, a, a whole bunch of stuff. And then the city put a bike path straight to the middle. So really idyllic site at Ohio State, still there. And then, lo and behold, I moved to uh, Southwest Florida, and my lab's in Naples, Florida, and I find that down the street there's a wetland that was, uh, shall we say, copied from the Olentangy wetland, or at least inspired. Same size, 50 acres, almost unbelievable. And it's called the Fred W. Cole, they're all named after people, Fred W. Cole Freedom Park, in Naples, Collier County, Florida. And uh, its concept, it was a very nice design, Jim Bays from uh, CH2M and Tampa, Florida designed it, a very nice design of taking urban runoff uh, in Naples, putting it through a settling pond and then through a series of, of wetlands and then back through a bottom line forest and eventually to the Gordon River, which in a couple miles downstream goes straight into the Naples Bay and the coastal system. So it was meant to, to uh, take nutrients out of the water and our recent studies in this place, it's still working about a decade later. So I'm showing you that because those are the big scale ecology that I love to do. And by big scale, I mean not little test tube stuff. But here's the issue that I want to bring forward to you guys that has not been talked about here. And I think, I've got to be careful saying this, it's almost as serious as climate change. And it's exacerbated by climate change. And this is the eutrophication of our planet. We have literally saturated all the good farmland areas of the world with nutrients far and above what's required. We continue to do it every year. There's no stop to it. It's getting worse every year. And I'm gonna give you a couple case studies then of excessive amounts of nutrients just causing excessive problems in two regions, one in Florida and one in Ohio but it's sometimes called hypoxia, harmful algal blooms. They don't use the word eutrophication anymore. It, it's kind of been thrown away. Uh, but harmful algal blooms, everybody knows what that is. Uh, and it's due to nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's two chemicals out of the entire periodic table that are causing problems. There is a third chemical that I think wetlands can deal with, that's carbon. I don't have time to talk about that, so I'm gonna focus on these. And I'm gonna go to two, 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 two case studies. One is the Florida Everglades. How many people have been to the Everglades? The part you saw is probably very beautiful, but the plumbing on it is a disaster. 
This left is what it used to be, the, the river of grass. It flowed north to south. Very simple system, o Okeechobee overflowing. And this is what's going on now that has everybody all excited. There's so much water that they're now spilling it left and right to the ocean and to the Gulf of Mexico. And in a couple years, in 2016, it was an absolute disaster what they did. Uh, so they're affecting the, and the reason they don't send it south is because everybody says, oh, you don't want to send the nutrients to the Everglades. Damn it, the, the wetland can handle it better than the estuary, come on. Uh, but no, they won't do that. So you can see all this drainage work that goes through the greater Miami area. It really is a hydrologic mess. Now, what they want to do, and they call it restoration, is to get the water to go south through the park. So they want this north-south thing, but there's just so much trouble, so many, and so much politics that stands in the way of it. And, and there's geopolitics, there's agri-politics, you name it. So on the next slide, I'm going to summarize sort of what's going on in the Everglades in 2016 when everybody was just exhausted with this high nutrient problem. It was a GIS flight <laughs> over uh, Florida. It says, look, George, you can see the corrupt and immoral environmental policies from here. And it shows Florida just sopping with algae coming out of the southern part of Everglades. And that's, of course, it's political cartoons, it's exaggeration. But it's no exaggeration that it is a political and ecological mess down there. But there is one thing that the uh, state agency did that, that was cool and, and was right for dealing with this high nutrient problem, and that was building treatment wetlands in the Everglades. The only thing is they're not allowed to call them treatment wetlands. The lawyers won't let them, so they have to call them STA, stormwater treatment areas. And I'll swear, I'm so tired of getting manuscripts from those people and it says STAs, and I say, no, it's a, tr it's a wetland. And they said, no, my lawyer says I can't say that. Why, I don't know. They just didn't want these wetlands to be, be covered under the Clean Water Act or something. Anyhow, whatever we call them, they work. Uh, the stormwater areas are in the light green. You see them right there, there's about six of them total. Are you guys okay with metric? It's about 60,000 acres of wetlands. There is no place in the world where that many wetlands have been created solely to take care of pollution, and the pollution they're taking care of is phosphorus. They don't want the phosphorus to get down to the Everglades. And they work. This is what they look like. Does that look like a wetland to you? Say yes, go on. <laughs> it, no? <laughs> there's submerged, whoops, there's, there's submerged aquatics here and there's emergent here, but it's, they're wetlands, come on. Um, now these are mesocosms that I just told you are, are usually tiny little experiments, and we did a study for about three or four years with the South Florida Water Management District, and we actually showed that you could tease the water level down to 10 parts per billion that's the of phosphorus. That's the concentration in rainwater. So these wetlands work. And this was a news release that came out this summer from the South Florida Water Management District, who are not ashamed at all of doing this, patting themselves on the back. Um, and they said the stormwater treatments have a record year. Constructed mar oh, they called them marshes. Oh, my God. Uh, constructed marshes produce cleanest water since their inception. So they're very proud of them, they work, it's a good end. They just need 100,000 more acres of them. <laughs> okay. I'm jumping north now. Ohio, Western Lake Erie, what a mess. Every year, including this year, this year was the worst eutrophication ever according to the newspapers, who knows how you measure it, but the western basin of Lake Erie is the shallowest part of the shallowest lake in the Laurentian Great Lakes. And it's the place we're going to see this first. There are a whole bunch of rivers that come in there. Toledo is right there. Do you remember when Toledo had their water uh, cut off in 2014? Totally cut off. They were, it was a big, big news story. So these gr blooms, have been, and often it's microcystis, have been occurring every year. Well, the, it, what's ca causing it? It's an excessive amount of phosphorus getting into the basin there. Most of it from this river with a cute little name, the Mommy River. My daughters loved that when they were kids. The Mommy River. Where's Daddy River? Um, <laughs> and uh, this is an actual photograph, by the way, of the, the bloom in 2000 and 
uh, 11. That was the first year that they started coming back, and they're, they're there for keeps now. Every year they have to expect this. And they, they've done, it's kind of funny, this is the Ohio Lake Erie Phosphorus Task Force. You would think they would study what the problem is before putting it in their title, but they all claimed it was, you know, everybody said, oh, that's phosphorus. So, um, but they basically said that nutrient impairment is impacting $11.5 billion industry. $11.5 billion industry. People are just not going to Lake Erie for recreation or anything now because it's got the perception that it's just a trashed lake. So, here to the rescue will come wetlands someday. So you're gonna, you gotta follow this story. To the west of Lake Erie, there used to be an area called the Black Swamp. Honest, I didn't make that up. And it was uh, one, well I got 400,000 hectares there. If you do the math, it's how much? Acres? Uh, about a million acres, million acre wetland. I mean, we're talking about a Everglades scale wetland in Northwest Ohio. It was also, by the way, the boundary between Ohio, the state, and Michigan, the territory. And it's the reason we hate Michigan and Michigan hates Ohio and why the Ohio State Michigan game is such a, they don't know that, by the way, but it was a, <laughs> no, it was a shooting war. They were at war with each other. Because what were they fighting over? Toledo? <laughs> yeah, really, I mean, come on. Uh, Michigan claimed that Toledo was part of their territory and, and uh, Ohio won because Ohio was already a state and Michigan wasn't. So, you know, who's Congress gonna vote for? Come on. But anyhow, the Black Swamp is, is sort of central to our latest idea of solving this problem once and for all. Uh, we have to go back to the history of that the wonderful, uh, if you guys just type that uh, undark.org or write it down and go look at that webpage, it's a wonderful blog that a, a woman I know who's a science writer, very good science writer, she spent a year researching this topic because she asked me what, what's interesting I should look at. I said, the black swamp solving the Lake Erie pollution? She says, what? I said, trust me, you, you'll find out an amazing story. She, told the whole story of the drainage of the Black Swamp, how the farmers there, if you say the word wetlands, you better run because they're gonna shoot you. It really is a dramatic story. Um, and in the end, she completes the circle because then she called me and says, well now Bill, I've got, it, I've got it all figured out, the wetlands will take out the, but who has ever built an enormous number of wetlands to treat phosphorus? And I said, Florida. <laughs> and she followed up on that. and. and completed the story. So, this is the ditch, one of the ditches that goes through there. It is, it's ditch city there. It's every, they, my friends who own this particular farm call them ditch Nazis. Because if you, if the, something blocks the flow in that ditch, they're out there and they're cleaning it out immediately because if there's any impediment, it, it messes up the whole system. So all of those ditches are raging rivers in February, March, and April, right after the thaw goes straight into Lake Erie, and that's why Lake Erie is green. I'll bet my entire reputation on that. And, and so, we've set up an experiment. These are mesocosm tubs, 100 gallons each. We set up a mesocosm experiment on that same farm. You can see the ditch in the horizon there. Bowling Green University is helping us too. And uh, it will look like this. This is one we've already built in Buckeye Lake. Yes, there is a Buckeye Lake that's near Columbus, uh, where they also have a big serious eutrophication problem. And uh, you know, from these tests, we're gonna determine, and I'll show you later what we're gonna determine, but whether these wetlands can be effective to take nutrients out of the water on a big scale. But you, ha you have to test it somehow, and so these are our test tubes. Uh, so, from the big wetland that I showed you earlier, the, one, the kidney-shaped ones, right? We had data from 1994 to 2010 of phosphorus removal, and we, the, the error bars are based on annual numbers, not daily numbers. And the, uh, you can take it to the bank, a wetland in Ohio could take out two grams of phosphorus for every square meter per year. So we used those numbers, just published a paper uh, that has as a preference that it's, we've been told by modelers that a 40% reduction in total phosphorus to the Western Lake Erie is 
estimated as necessary to reduce the algal blooms. So that's our, our goal. And we determined, very simple calculation, the restoring 20,000 to 40,000 hectares, or 50,000, or, or sorry, hectares, or 50,000 to 100,000 acres, or 5 to 10 percent of the wetlands of the Black Swamp could reduce phosphorus loading by 18 to 37 percent. So we're starting to use 100,000 acres, 10 percent of the Black Swamp. That's what we have to bring back. That's, it, it would be a sizable, it would be even bigger than what they did down in Florida, but it's very doable. So this is, just so you know what the Black Swamp used to look like, there's a small remnant forest, a couple hundred acres left, no more than that, and it's called Gall Woods. It's a state uh, reserve in Ohio, sort of the remnant of the Black Swamp. You know, just, it was a woody forest. It was called a swamp for the right reason. Um, that's our phrase. <laughs> It is called the Great Black Swamp by a lot of people, so let's make the, great, the Black Swamp great again. Okay, now our brand new landscape research initiative. This is hot off the press. This was stimulated, I have to be honest, we were a little ahead of the game, but uh, there was an announcement by the, the uh, Everglades Foundation. That's down in the Everglades. They, they pick the pockets of all corporate people who retire down there, make them feel bad for trashing the environment and take millions of dollars away from them. They announced a $10 million prize, $10 million prize, if you could develop a method that takes phosphorus out of the water and returns it to society, usually agriculture. If you can come up with a method. Well, we were finalists for the phase one but it became very clear to me, they're not looking for a landscape, the stuff you guys do, the stuff we do. They were not looking for a landscape scale solution at all. They were looking for a contraption that sat on the bench of an engineer. I'm telling you, that's not gonna work. Um, and the reason I know that is because they wanted us to bring our contraption up to Ontario, Canada next year to test it. We said, we can't put our wetland on a flatbed truck and take it up to Ontario, Canada. And they said, well, Bill, the rules have to be the same for everybody. Well, it's a stupid rule. So we had to back out. But it was, the, it was that $10 million prize that we were originally designing this for. And I got some of the best scientists in the USA to be on part of our team. And they all agreed, this will work. We call it wetland culture, which equals wetlands plus agriculture. And I'm not gonna give away all my trade secrets here, but here's sort of, <laughs> A is what we're doing now which is totally unsustainable. Every year, we are putting more fertilizer in the land. It, we get legacy fertilizer in the land, staying there even more every year. You know, we're getting food, of course, and a lot of it goes back into our lake streams, rivers, it either stays there or goes to the ocean. But it's an untenable long-term process. It's just not gonna work long time. So the idea of wetland culture is to recycle the nutrients from uh, some wetlands back to agriculture. That's the one inflow to the wetlands, that's the outflow of the wetlands that goes back to agriculture. I, I don't have time to tell you how we're gonna do it, but it's so simple, my kids could do this. And we're basically getting rid of the, uh, that's what's the most important. We are stopping the fertilization when you do this method. There's no other way to solve Lake Erie's problems, and indeed our landscape problems around the world, than to go co almost cold turkey on, on fertilizers, at least for the next 100 years while we deplete what we've put in the landscape. Okay, I have some pictures of what, how this will look. <laughs> pictures. This is a little sketches that my artist did. This is Western Lake Erie and the Great Black Swamp. This is what it looked like in 1810. It was an, a, a swamp, and this shows a, a, it's supposed to show a carriage with a broken wheel on a, anybody know what these roads are? Corduroy, Corduroy roads, yes, you get A. <laughs> uh, that's the only way people can get through there, otherwise it was just a forested swamp. <coughs> and all sorts of stories of people trying to get through that. Why they were going to Michigan, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> so that's, that's 1810, 200. 200 years, <laughs> the what? <laughs> yeah. 200 years later, approximately 200, 2010, Western Lake Erie, it's all row crop, 
corn ditches like the ones I showed you. The Maumee River is brown now. I don't know what it was 200 years. Lake Erie is sort of brownish, but a lot of green back in it. It's supposed to show more green. It's polluted. And then, by the way, there's Toledo. Um, maybe in 2050, if we have an integration of corn plus, if we have wetland culture, which means agriculture and wetlands combined, we don't have the drainage towels as much. The Maumee River is blue again. By the way, those are supposed to be fish jumping out of the water with happiness, not dead fish floating on the water. <laughs> and Lake Erie is blue again, and we're all happy. So there's my projection for what we could do. Uh, I'll give you one final principle, and then I'll be quiet here. And this is one I give on many of my talks. Ecosystem restoration and creation are not easy. They require attention to Mother Nature. Mother Nature, I mean self-design. She's in charge. She's the chief engineer. We can give little choices. We can pick our favorite 30 plants and put them in there. Maybe she only wants three. You've got to do that. You can't fight Mother Nature when you're designing ecosystems. It's futile. So that's number one, Mother Nature. The other is Father Time. These projects just take time to reach their potential, and there's no speed button that you can push to make a restoration quicker. Time is the essence. That's why you go back to my original slide, why I wanted to do experiments on large scales, and as long and on long scale, or at least as long as Ohio State let me stay there, um, long scale uh, temporal, because that's where our real design question is going to be answered. They're not answered on a, I'm sorry, a PhD thesis won't, is not long enough. A master's thesis is not long enough. It really answered over a long time and over large scales, usually much more scale than a university will give you. I was just lucky at Ohio State. So that's my talk, and thank you very much.